Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Unfolding Realities. Um, we have, I think, an exciting program ahead of us for the day. My name's Nathan Cohen, and I'm the uh, course leader for the MA Art and Science. Um, I use the word leader quite lightly because it's not always clear who's leading and who's being led. Um, <laughs> I'm sure today is going to be proof of that. But I think that it's an important point because the MA Art and Science is really an idea. It's also a forum for discussion and debate. And it's also a space where we are able to investigate and explore ideas relating to art and science. And it's also a laboratory where we can experiment and uh, undertake that journey together. And each year we invite 20 people or so to join us in that journey of discovery. And this year you will be seeing the exhibition later on uh, at lunchtime uh, of the 20 who will be graduating um, as part of the second year program. What I'd like to do before we begin is give you a quick rundown on what we're going to be doing today. If I press the right button. Oh, there we go. Right, technology. It's the one thing they never teach you on art and science. So there we go. Good. Oh, yes, sorry. I think, I think Heather ought to do this, really. But, um, the Wi-Fi. If you need access to Wi-Fi, you'll find it down there. It's quite a long code. Um, so you have about 10 seconds to scribble that down. I'll read it out for you. It's 5H0R1C04R53. OK, they keep things simple here. Right, OK, so before we begin, though, um, some housekeeping. It's very unlikely we're going to have a fire alarm go off. But should it happen, you have two exits, one through the door here, the main entrance as it came in, and the other one through here. And if you do have to run out of the building, try not to run, but quietly walk in an orderly fashion back out the way you came, and we will be gathering in the front of the building in the Granary Square. So that's just in case we do have any, any alarms going off. And the bathrooms are easily found by going across the corridor slightly towards the front and around to the side. So you don't have to sit here with cross legs all day. Um, we are going to be having uh, a number of things happening today. This morning, we're going to be hearing from our students who are graduating, six of them. And there are going to be uh, th two groups of three presenting uh, with a panel discussion, which is going to be chaired by Heather Barnett, who's um, my partner in running the program. And after lunch, uh, we're very privileged to be having a panel discussion with a number of distinguished guest speakers, including Rachel Armstrong, Oren Katz, who's literally just flown in from Australia, Eve Middleton Kelly, and chaired by Rob Lafrenet. So that will happen this afternoon, starting at about 2.30. And at the end of that, um, we'll be finishing around about four. You can go across just the other side of the street here, and we can get a drink. It is, I'm afraid, a cash pay bar only, but if people want to carry on discussions and so on, that would be a good place to go and do it. We'll also be having, uh, during the lunch break, a slightly extended lunch break between 1 and 2.30, so that you have a chance to see the degree show, and some of the students will be there, and happy to talk to you about their work if you're interested. I think that covers everything. Um, so I'm going to now hand over to Heather, and I hope you have a, a very enjoyable day. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, and welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Heather Barnett. I'm a course lecturer on the MA Art and Science. Um, and I'm going to be looking after the morning session with the student panel. Um, since the course started, the first year of graduation, which was 2013, we have had a symposium, a public forum for the students to, to share their research um, 
an extension from presenting their, their physical artefacts and artworks in the, in the degree show. Um, and we're really pleased that you've all come today on the Saturday to hear the students and to uh, external speakers um, who are all connected with interdisciplinary practice in some shape or form. Today is the second day of our residency in the Futuro House. The aim of this was to explore how our research that is in art and science deeply integrated relates to our degree show and how we can present it. And uh, we had a workshop um, with these architectural Lego pieces, uh, exploring these conceptual ideas of approaching how we could do that, how we could present this research. We've all come together after working separately for a while and we've been asking a lot of questions and creating Lego sculptures that reflect the concepts behind our work. We connected all of our structures that we'd made individually and also created links between them in terms of the concepts and also the research. There's a breathtaking scope um, of, of practice on the course. Um, people that treat the outdoors as a laboratory and people that treat the inside of a lab like a studio. Um, the way that people come about their work is often very unique to themselves, but there's often uh, a peculiar direction to it. The way in which people work is extraordinarily valuable to the group dynamic um, and the diversity of ways in which people work. Because you have this rigour and methodology that comes from the more scientific members of the group, um, which breaks things down and, and reconfigures them, that, that looks at the component parts and arranges them. Um, and then you've got people whose touch is much lighter, who for whom the process of science is more like natural history, who explore and document and, and draw together observations of the world around them. It's always difficult to put a theme to such a diverse selection of people from so many different practices, but if I was to, to name an undercurrent, something that pins it all together, it's process. I think there's some extraordinarily sensitive work and rigorous work and a very, it's, a little, it's an ecosystem of ideas going on really here. And it's a very, it's a fundamentally interdisciplinary course with mathematicians and neuroscientists and artists. Everyone's brought their own little population of thoughts and concepts and methods, and they've all interbred and cross-pollinated. And I think we've mutually influenced each other to a really, in a really interesting way. I've been looking a little bit at complex systems and that was definitely woven into how we approach the design, um, but on a kind of a latent level. Um, it's the way that lots of seemingly separate, totally autonomous, unique individuals come together to make something that's larger than the sum of its parts. And so we, um, we had many, many meetings and conversations in which we in which we went over what was required, what are the base units, do you need a wall, do you need a table, do you need a dark space, do you need something up high, does your work need room to breathe? Uh, we tried to build a design that was greater than the sum of its parts, that could, that could provide what was required for the individual, but also link them together across space um, with curatorial sight lines, ways of connecting work, not just through proximity, but through meaning and how meaning can sort of gesture across space. You've got this whole range of different things that go into a degree show, and all that's ever seen at the end is this final polished product. Um, but actually it's a, it's a system with many different inputs and outputs um, in which everyone is involved equally in, in getting the thing manifested, in turning it from concept to reality. Okay, so yeah, the, this film was made by one of our first year students, Leon Radzinski, um, to accompany the degree show. Um, and it's been following the students for the last three months. So from when we first hot housed them in, you saw the spaceship there, which is a 1960s holiday home, which is sitting on our, on our terrace up on the roof. Um, 
And we, we hothoused them for uh, three days to talk about curatorial issues, um, how they wanted to curate their work individually and collectively, the integration of, of research um, and practice within a degree show. Um, and I think, uh, and I hope you'll all agree when you go and see the show, if you haven't seen it yet, that there is re a re strong cohesion uh, within those, with those elements, that, there is, uh, that the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So the format for this morning, we're going to have two panels. We've got six speakers all together. So we're going to have three short presentations from students and then we'll invite them all up to take questions uh, collectively at the end. Um, and we'll do two, two rounds of that. Uh, so the, this morning, the first panel um, will be Stephanie Wong on embodied cognition, Alexandra Boris on the overview effect and Marta Pinilla on the metaphors of folding. So I'm going to introduce uh, Stephanie Wong, who came to us from a background in neuroscience um, and has been working, her work has been exploring the relationship between mind, body and the external environment. Um, so looking at materiality, but inspired by neuroscience and, and cognitive effect. So Stephanie. working. Can you hear me? There we go. <laughs> um, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the, basically the work that I've been doing. Um, coming from a neuroscience background, I did um, an undergraduate in neuroscience. Um, then to an art school was a very steep learning curve, but um, the course has been amazing. And it's given me the opportunity to ask questions that I didn't even know that I could ask before. And the freedom to explore it through my artistic process, through an artistic practice. Um, so uh, I've been looking into the really small subject of how the brain can create something like this. And also something like this, which is hopefully you recognize it, it's our degree show outside. So there's a massive disparity between how we understand brain function and how it results in the richness of human experience. And so this is what I've been exploring through my practice. Um, when I did neuroscience, we mainly learned about the brain in isolation. And this is a very new subject. So for example, the top image is um, a drawing by Ramon E. Cajal. <laughs> I was trying to help me with my pronunciation. And um, he did really beautiful drawings, and he was one of the first, um, he was a pioneer in neuroscience. He was the first pe person to realize that neurons were isolated cells. And then these are kind of more recent images of neurons, and um, you can see the kind of the structure and the physiological processes. But you can't really understand anything in isolation. And actually, the brain is part of the whole body. And it's really important to understand its relationship to the body and also to the external environment to understand how human experience comes about. So through the course, I came into contact with this philosopher. Um, he's Morris Merleau ponty and he's part of a branch of philosophy of mind called phenomenology. Um, and this quote really resonated with me. He said, I do not see space according to its exterior envelope. I live it from the inside. I am immersed in it. After all, the world is all around me, not in front of me. And he actually influenced a field of cognitive science called embodied cognition, which is what I've been looking into. And it essentially elevates the role of the body in perception, and also the interaction with your environment in the way that we understand the world. And this is a really interesting area to explore through artwork. So this is a recent exhibition that happened last year at the Hayward Gallery by uh, an artist called Carsten Holler. And uh, this piece is called Upside Down Goggles. And it inverts your vision 
so that everything you see is upside down. And it's taken from an experiment conducted in the 1890s, where if you actually wear these for an extended period of time, your vision becomes normal again. And it demonstrates how your brain is, it's called perceptual adaptation, and it demonstrates how your brain basically can adapt to the environment based on your interactions with your surroundings. Um, Merleau-Ponty has influenced a lot of installation work and this is another piece that happened really recently at the Welcome Collection by Anne Veronica Janssen where you go into a space of coloured mist, some of you might have been there, and you can't really see very much and so you have to rely on your proprioception and the rest of your body to find yourself through the space and you become much more aware of other individuals within the space as well. Uh, and these ideas have strongly underpinned the work that I've been making as well. So this is uh, the first installation that I made for the course, for the interim show. Uh, and I created a maze with um, UV torches hanging inside it. And you had to walk through the maze and you used the torches to kind of reveal these images that I'd put on the walls. So it allowed the viewer to explore an environment through the interaction. And this is my final piece for the show. So it's uh, quite a big piece. <laughs> and I was really struggling photographing it. And then I realized that was kind of the point of what I was trying to achieve. <laughs> so it allows the viewer to see it from multiple perspectives. You can't really see it from one position. So you need to walk around it to fully see what it is. And I think this, this area of embodied cognition is a quite an exciting um, field of cognitive science to explore through artistic practice. And this course has definitely given me the tools to be able to do that into the future. So thank you very much. So I'll pass over to Alexandra Boris, um, who is, um, came to us from a background from choreography and dance. Um, and her work has been exploring the relationship between the body and gravity. So, Alex. Thank you, Heather. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming here. Uh, I would like to start with the letter, letter experiment of collectively finding our spine within our own bodies. So if you would like to join me and close your eyes for a moment, that would be quite nice. If you don't feel comfortable with that, it's fine as well. So just take a deep breath in and breathe out. And if you would like to start slowly, slow and subtle rocking movement and shift your weight of your body from one of your sitting bones to another, you will bring your tailbone into a movement. So as you're going between your sitting bones, you can imagine the lady tailbone moving from right to left. And then if you move, shift the movement a bit higher and you bring it to your hips and you start rocking your hips to the right and left, you can visualize your lower back and spine in this area moving from right to left. So as we move a bit higher and you start moving your rib cage from right to left, you can imagine the whole spine in your upper body moving right and left. Then if you bring the movement a little bit to your shoulders, the movement of the spine goes higher. So if you slightly start bending your neck to the right and left, you can feel the spine in your neck moving a little bit. And then if you shift the movement to your head and you start moving your head from right to left, as you would be saying no, that activates the second from the top vertebra so you can imagine how high it goes. And then if you change this movement to the nodding movement, so as you would be saying yes, 
that activates the very last vertebra on top of the spine. And this one goes as high as somewhere in between our ears. So if you calm down the movement now, you can allow yourself to feel the weight of your spine that you just placed within your body. Thank you very much for collaboration. <laughs> uh, let me now explain why I asked you to do that and how spine became such an important part of my work. So starting with the image, that's what we all just felt within our own bodies. Um, so as Heather said, I'm coming from the background of dance and choreography. So my work was always strongly related to the body, body's anatomy, ways of how the body can move and the physics of that. I mostly worked with the on the stage environment. Um, I started working with the installation where relation between the body and the objects moving together in space and in the, uh, influencing each other became quite an important part of my practice as well. And coming to MA Arts and Science, uh, I became strongly inspired by what happens to the body once it's taken away from our home environment, so away from Earth, away from gravity, and it finds itself in the minimum gravity environment. <clears throat> so at first I started researching the, or reading the NASA research about that, uh, watching on a daily basis what's happening on the International Space Station and how astronauts deal with their bodies on the board there. And that led me to create um, a video work in 2015, uh, which is called 9.81 States of Attempts. And that's basically a human body on, a, on Earth with an environment that includes gravity, trying to embody and experience the state of non-gravitational uh, environment. So uh, I was mostly, I set myself a list of rules that I took from, from the research that NASA did. So I adopted the changes that are happening to the body in the space as the rules for me to create the movement. So that would be uh, a minimum effort of muscles whenever I make a movement, because muscles don't really have to work as hard as uh, without the gravity as they have to work here. Um, the other bit was um, bones and skeleton are expanding constantly in space. So that was another thing that I had to keep in mind all the time, imagining that <clears throat> my joints are ex expanding with each movement that I'm making. And then the last bit that was I think the most brain tricking was that whatever movement I make has no relation to the environment around me. So there is no body space relation. There is only body to body relation. Uh, so that's the video that, that works eight minutes long. We're not gonna watch it all. Uh, basically, uh, continuing that, I really wanted to hear from astronauts how does it feel, like what's the poetics of experiencing physically lack of gravity. Uh, so I've been reading and watching the interviews, but no one would give me the answer. So what I found, on the other hand, was the, um, that everyone was talking about the overview effect. So uh, the name of the overview effect was created by Frank White. It's basically the phenomenon of what happens to humans once you see the Earth from the distance and how that changes your relationship to the Earth, but also how it makes you feel that you are a part of it, that all the living on the planet and the planet itself is one being. So taking that idea, it's like, all right, what can I do with that? So I stepped away from 
what I knew as a home, so the body that I would always work with, and I looked at it from the distance. So I looked at the skeleton and started analyzing it, uh, as I usually know it. So feet at the bottom, legs carrying the rest of the body, legs used for locomotion, uh, the middle part of the body with most of the organs taking care of that, uh, arms being a bit higher, responsible from reaching and discovering the surrounding, and the head being on top of it, sort of sensorial center that analyzes everything what's happening. So then I was like, that's very nice. It works on Earth, it's very hierarchical. We see how it works. But once this understanding of the body goes into environment, into environment without the gravity, the functionality does not make any sense. Uh, so I thought, how, how do I imagine that? And then I came across this image that started to make more sense. Having a spine in the middle with two strong scalp and pelvis at both ends, um, ribcage in the middle, and then four limbs that from the bone structure point of view are extremely similar. So that gave me the idea that once we don't have set rules, what are the functions of the limbs, we can start building them from the beginning. Uh, so that was quite a great idea, but I didn't know where to start. So I came back to the spine again to, to have the starting point. Yeah. And then I started thinking about it, all right, what, once I'm on Earth, how can I change my way of thinking about the body being used on a daily basis? So the first idea was, if the spine is the main core of my body, what is the gravity? So I thought, what if the gravity is just agreement between my spine and the surface of the Earth? So for those two, in order to work, they had to create legs just long enough so the feet can reach the surface on the earth so they can carry my spine and make it <laughs> move in space. So that, that way of thinking allowed me to sort of come and reach another point that I really wanted to. Because watching astronauts, I got really jealous about the fact that they could just hang there in the space, bend their legs, and then suddenly be seated. So I'm like, that's great, I always have to go down. So then, <clears throat> following the idea that there is no um, body-space relationship in a um, non-gravity environment, there is no up and down, back and front, right, left. So there is no possibility of falling and rising. So I could skip that and be free to do whatever I want, because if I just wanted to bend both legs at the same time, I could do it even if I fell. That didn't matter, because falling didn't exist. So that was a great discovery, but the, it didn't let me too far anywhere yet, uh, and the degree show was coming over, so <laughs> <laughs> I had to come up with the, some sort of representation of of the whole research that I've been doing. Uh, so this is how I came up with the space snake, uh, which structure is, is quite similar to how the spine is created from singular vertebrae. So you have singular images sewed together. Uh, there is a collection of specific images uh, on each you can see Earth in the constellation with different planets, moons, uh, and sun that normally wouldn't be, able, wouldn't be realistic. But in my imagination, they help me place Earth in the context of space, other than just somewhere no one knows where. Um, and then another thing also, the way the installation is placed was quite important for me, because no matter from what kind of position you would look at it, you would always have images under you, above you, and on your sides. So if you, even if you go and lie on the floor, there would be something in front of you. So, um, 
an idea, let me, so that was the whole idea of how small change in understanding or thinking of our body can change our approach and relation to the surrounding that we're living in. Thank you. <laughs> Um, our third and final speaker for this section is Marta Pania. Um, Marta has a background in biology and art, um, and her, wants, her claim in her biography is to find a unified theory of everything um, through mind, body, and space through folding. Marta will tell us more about it. Well... Uh, my name is Marta Pinilla, as you can notice from my accent, I'm not from England, I'm from Spain, and I'm going to introduce myself. This is me, this, 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 all of this. Uh, I'm quite obsessed with folding and folding paper, and I want to share my obsession with you today. So in your seat should be one piece of paper like that, if not, as other people don't, doesn't come, you can take one of the free ones. And uh, I want that you share my obsession trying to teach you how to fold paper. Uh, you can follow my instructions or be creative. I know that it's not very easy, so don't worry if you don't get it at the first attempt. Uh, you can do it later, you can ask to me to teach you later in the uh, place. And the most important is you need to relax and enjoy the process. So the first thing, you need to take the paper and fold it diagonal, oh, sorry, like by the diagonal, like an accordion. Usually don't shake it too much. And you should have something like a little accordion with mountains and valleys, like that, or like the picture. Uh, this paper is a very special paper. It's called proto paper, and have prefolded, uh, like preperforated the lines, so it's more easy to, to fold. And when you have it done like that. And so, well, I want to wait a little because not everybody <coughs> has it yet. Well, I continue. You need to open, like, playing the accordion and do the same in the other diagonal. Is uh, folding paper is quite it's a kind of meditation, so maybe some of you feel more relaxed at the end. I need to feel more relaxed too. <laughs> and the same, open it, and the last thing you need to do it by the vertical lines, and at the end you will have something like that that is a little accordion to it in vertical lines. So this is the easy part. We need to do, do it before because paper has memory. And to fold a pattern, you need to do universal pleats. That is the thing that we are doing now uh, to create the pattern. Because if not, if you use a big sheet as I use it uh, in the work, it's going to be very difficult to fold. And now is the complicated part. So I hope all of you get your little accordion or fan. And in that moment, the, the pictures are not mine. I'm from Paul Jackson, that he's a great in folding. You need to, you don't need, you don't need to do a new uh, fold. You need to crease using your finger and your thumbs, making a double zigzag in the middle. Uh, it, you need, it's very easy. You see, it is. <laughs> well, not so easy, I know. But uh, you only have to follow the, the lines of the folding. And at the end, this will get something like that. 
is the same on the picture. And you have to repeat the process all the time. And then you finish with the paper. I know that this, some of you, is the first time, the first attempt is not easy to do it. But then it's easy to do it. Well, don't worry. You can try it in your home or whatever you want. <laughs> so oh, for me, it's more difficult today. At the end, you will have something like that. Like a double <laughs> six <-pack. laughs> Well, <laughs> try. Well, you yeah, that works. That works. Look, I have it. <laughs> well, well, you try to do it and try attend, so you are not so focused on what I'm saying. I wait, I want to explain uh, why folding is so important to me. I want to introduce my work. Is that thing that you can see in the space, and it's all made that folding paper with a lot of much more uh, A2 uh, seats like that. And maybe the same remains you something. Well, all started with this picture. This is a picture of the brain taken with a fluorescent microscope. And the other one is a picture of the universe. Take it with an infrared telescope and then enhance it with computer, it's, uh, have it behind. And when I saw it the first time, for me, uh, it created something in my mind. I, as I have a background in biology, and usually uh, biologists uh, think that we are special because we are alive. And in that moment, um, I say, oh, maybe we are not so special. So I started to do research, and I found a book from David Yu. It's called Brain and Universe Two Cosmologies. And in that book, there is a lot of things in common between the brain and the universe. The structure of the brain and the universe is the same, the way that the cells, the brain cells grow, and the all the stars grow, uh, sorry, and the stars growth and death, how the universe is evolving. And for me, it's striking uh, because, it's, as I say, uh, I don't feel different from, uh, in that moment, I start to feel more close to not alive things. And uh, I result the similarities between dark matter and glia cells because it's the one I use it in the piece of the uh, exhibition. And then I continue researching about all the connections between the, the brain and the universe. I don't going to explain all of this because it takes me ages. And then I saw Mark Nequin and Miguel Aragon Calvo that he, they explaining how universe is created through origami. This is a picture from the paper research. And galaxies are created in a place where a fold, a gravity creates a fold in the matter and terms on the universe. And there is also metaphors related with origami and the brain, not only that beautiful brain that uh, uh, artists do uh, accurate. William Cheshire explained how grow, the growth of the brain is directly related with origami and folding. Uh, if some of you are familiar with this ima image, it's a microscope electron picture of the ectoderm that is in the egg, one of the first tissues, and, when, and the spine cord gets started to develop it when that tissue folded. As you can see, it's a little fold like one of these. And then I started to look more metaphors, and I find this man, that is Deleuze, and he wrote some marvelous book, marvelous book that is called The Fall. And I, this is one of his diagrams about behavior, human behavior related with origami and falls. And if you can see that image, for me, have a lot of similarities with this other image. It looks like a, 
a diagram of one of each other. So at the end, I, each time finding more and more and more relationship between all that kind of concept, concepts. So it opens a lot of questions. For me, it opened questions from philosophical to religious or scientific questions. First one is the human brain and the universe has so many things in common, really it's true. It could be the two the same thing. It could be we, we can live in a, some kind of fractal cosmos where brain and the universe is the same thing and it opens other questions. We could have a universe inside our head or we could be in the mind of something. This is quite religious or quite philosophical, but it's a question that I ask it to, my, to myself. And also, uh, is folding paper is a metaphor from brain, from human behavior, from the universe. Could be origami, a metaphor of everything. As mathematics, they look that formal, that or physics, that could explain everything. Could be origami, that is a kind of, at the end, is a kind of topology. Uh, that explanation, more artistic way or not. I'm still looking for the answer of these two questions. And if you have any, any answer for me or any in the paper, if you don't fold it, you can have my Twitter and my Instagram, so you can uh, send all the information for me, if you have it. And also, uh, I want to, the next time that you fold a paper, think in all that kind of thing that maybe you are trying to explain, most in that only a folding paper. Thank you very much. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so I'm going to throw it out straight to the, to the floor. If you have questions or comments you'd like to make to any of the individuals, to, to Stephanie, to Marta, to, to Alexandra, um, or if you have general questions that you'd like to, to throw them about, the, about their practice and what they presented today. So who, who would like to start? Yes. Who does the dance? Yeah. Alexandra. I'd like to know, if you have a spinal injury, do you think in space it wouldn't matter? Um, Is that a bit <laughs> obscure? Sorry. So, um, <laughs> I do recommend. Uh, basically, um, there are different kind of injuries that happen in space. That's the problematic that the body is not really used in, in no um, gravity environment. But what does happen is that um, it depends what kind of injury of the spine you have. But what does happen, the spine expands. So the space between the vertebrae is opening and in theory it does relax a little bit. Uh, what what happened is, um, gonna, that's going to be embarrassing, uh, Stephen Ho, Stephen Ho, the, yeah. Ho, how do you say the last name? Hawking. Hawking. Uh, his body is totally paralyzed and he did uh, go on a little journey to experience the zero gravity and that he was really happy with that and nothing um, injured his body any more than it was. Uh, quite the opposite, everyone thought that maybe he finally can feel a bit relaxed. But uh, that's <laughs> as much as I could find in the <laughs> research. But I, I would imagine that, yeah, that should should just do the job. <laughs> yeah. Okay, see. You were quiet this morning. <laughs> okay, I have a hand. Oh, it's a question for Marta. Um, I guess I'm also deeply interested in folding and things like that. Um, one thing when I'm interested in, when you were talking about folding the universe and all sorts of different concepts, are you just keeping to just a folding of paper, where it's almost like paper's just a flat surface? Or are you also interested in like, things like folding of other surfaces? Because obviously, things like folding of curved, curved surfaces, of spheres, of hyperbole, things like that, hyperbolic surfaces. Is that something you're also interested in, or are you particularly interested in flat surfaces and folding those? For... 
Well, I I, I phone more than flat services. I floated. I also started to use clothes and silks, and uh, also. Uh, oh, it's quite difficult to, to explain it in English. Uh, yes, I, I obviously I will be interested in develop my work because. For me, it's very important to add as much dimensions as I can to um, to everything, uh, because if I try to explain the universe, the universe has a lot of dimensions. There's theories that say that it could have 20 or more. So as much dimension I could add, uh, it's going to be the better. So not flat surface, every other kind of surface could be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have a question, an open question to all of you. Um, so your work is engaged with scientific phenomena and, and concepts and the body and the relationship to the body. I wanted to ask you what, where, what your starting point is in terms of the projects that you've presented for the degree show today. What's the starting point and what's the, the process, the relationship between the conceptual and the material and, and the embodied? Mm -hmm. Steph, do you want to start? Um, yeah, so before I did the course, I didn't really have a practice. Well, I didn't have an artistic practice. So um, especially for the piece in the show, my starting point has, has I've realised, is playing with materials and choosing material that has properties that I'm really interested in and then using that as a way to dictate the form that the object takes. Um, and so... It's kind of, it's just, it's kind of an ongoing, ongoing process. And everything that I've been reading and looking into is kind of, is always in, in my mind. So it strongly influences everything that I'm doing as well. It's hard to disassociate any of it. So that's kind of how I've come to the final piece. Okay, thanks. Well, as I said before, I started uh, to research three, two years ago about all the relationship between the, the brain and the universe. And I started drawing because I draw more, but then I moved to three-dimensionality because uh, I want to uh, explain the multidimensionality of the space, like all the four, five, and I want to think, do things that change in space and time and not are exactly the same. So that's maybe my point. Uh, I think I was the most interested how how can I communicate the experience of no gravity by creating some sort of simple, as I call it, analog situation. So I didn't want to use high-tech media to create super environment or to play tricks, but I was interested how, by using simple tools, we can trick the brain to sort of confuse it in a way a little bit, so it loses the orientation. That probably would be there. And how important is it that a viewer, because obviously this is like an iterative process between kind of conceptual material and embodied practices, how important is it that the viewer, to what extent do you want them to to relate to the research and the, the background of the work. When are you prepared to, you know, to let go of where it comes um, from? It's kind of, I, I think we all feel this. It's, it's funny having um, a degree show because obviously you have a date that you have to finish everything by. And as soon as it's there, there are still so many things that you want to continue with it. Mm. So it's never fully relinquished in, in a way for me, at least, the, what I have on show is part of what I was doing before and already I'm thinking about the ways that I want to move forward with the things I'm exploring. So I think it, to have that interaction with people and to talk about, you know, I mean, I think as soon as you put it on display, it's, you know, it's not really yours so much as yeah. whatever anyone feels about it. I think... Yeah, as you say, once 
you get a chance to talk to people, it sort of creates the fur further thoughts and further ideas. So it is the idea that goes on to a certain direction, but I don't, I don't know how soon, what's the point where one thing ends and a new thing starts, or rather, rather it's just a process of me metamorphosis. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's true, it's a continuum of researching and, conti and each day, as much as you, you, sorry, as you research more ideas, you have more expanded your universe and your mind. And so nothing is ever finished. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got time for one or two more comments. Okay, there's one here, then there. Any others? Okay, we'll do these two. Uh, this is a question for Steph. Um, so I was interested in seeing how you're talking about when you were studying neuroscience at university, it was very much brain-focused, and then coming into the art, it became more body-focused, and how whether you think that um, much of what you're doing here is going to feed back into the kind of your past science-centred degree, and how many neuroscientists will be taking this kind of approach now? Um, when I... There, there's quite embodied cognition is, is quite um, is quite an interesting area, and it's definitely being it's it's kind of something that's already already part of neuroscience, but people are sort of taking it on and ex extending on it further because, as we understand the function of the brain, and as our, the tools that we use to understand it develop, we can we can. Um, understand it better and do these things that we weren't able to do before. But um, my interest in, in the body's relationship to the way that we perceive is based on how I enjoy exploring art and the types of work that I want to make. And so it's kind of been a, a um, theoretical under, underpinning to the things that I've become interested in. Mm. Um, I also have a, a question for Stephanie, um, and I think it relates to kind of the two examples that you gave, and also from what I see from here of your work. I haven't seen it outside yet, so I'm, I'm biased in that way. <laughs> Only seen it on the screen. Um, I was wondering what uh, your experience was as a maker, because um, you talked about um, embodied cognition. And um, the two examples that you gave and also uh, your work seems to look at it from uh, the viewer's perspective. It's focused on that. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, your experience as a maker and how that notion uh, kind of manifests itself in the process. Um, I, I suppose perhaps I, I see myself also as a viewer and essentially everyone can only experience the world through their own body and through how they interact with it and so um it's yeah it's in order especially uh making artwork that encourages people to interact with it is really difficult because um m most people well it, it, you it's kind of you don't know if you can or not and also people try moving away from trying to give direct instruction. And so to create something that's intuitively interactive is difficult. And when I did the, the maze, um, people ended up just going inside and shining the UV lights on each other, which was quite... Um, it was quite entertaining, actually, because you could see them through the fabric. But, um, yeah, from, from a making perspective, it's something that I'm very much... Um, I don't fully know the answer to that question, but I'm, I'm still kind of learning about how to um, explore the subject in that, in that respect. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to... Oh, one. Yep, we've got time. Mine's, like, not totally f formulated, but it's for Alex. Um, I do um, circus, well, I'm a rope artist, um, so I do cordelise, and uh, the most of what I do is 
defi like tricks to defy gravity. Mm. Um, and I like would define a trick as like as just that as like a, m a moment of suspension, and that's what I'm always after. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure what my question is exactly, but it's sort of an observation that that though the restraints of gravity um, like give us something to fight against. Mm. Um, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that was interesting question that I've been asking myself a lot. When I started the research, whether I want to fight the gravity and look for ways um, to visibly experience lack of gravity on Earth, which obviously <coughs> it will be a second of experience when you're suspended and then it's gone. That's why I sort of shifted and I try to convince myself that even if I'm sitting on the floor, if I truly believe that the floor does not exist, I'm in space. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that that started to be a bit... My, my interest shifted into trying to trick myself to believing something and then take it from there rather than risk my life <laughs> and go on there. <laughs> yeah, because I, I see what you mean, that there are those moments that are super tempting, but they're too short, and then <laughs> what do you do with this? Yeah, thank you. Are there any final questions or comments that you'd like to make for these three? Yes. <laughs> Um, just a couple of remarks. The, the, the first talk about the, the, the two slides that you showed uh, initially of, um, about perception. Did you say that they were what we had to make in our minds, those images? We had to see, we had to sort of recreate the, the richness of, uh, of what you showed on the screen there. I think, um, well, my, those two slides were kind of demonstrating... Um, that there is a massive, there is a massive disparity between how we can, in terms of what we understand in neuroscience, how we uh, reconcile our understanding of the world and how we see the brain and what we can, what we know about it already. Um, so, I suppose I used it as an example to just show that people can recognise that's London and that it's developed over a long period of time of of human creation. I, I'm, I'm only asking because there's, a, there's, there's a disputes about how to take all that, isn't there? There's a view that, that it all has to be encoded into the, in the brain so that we kind of reconstruct the outside world oh, by yeah. creating some image to look at. Yeah, that, and that's basically what embodied cognition is going against. Yes. I ha didn't really have time to go into that area, but... Um, there, there is that kind of. That's more of the the thought that your your mind is sort of a computational network that basically uh, reconstructs the world around you, and your body is more of an output device that kind of, and your your brain kind of reflects and reconstructs the world, mm. and you know all of these ideas are theories related to what people um, ha know about and the way people have. Um, kind of decided to understand the information. So it's an ongoing, yeah, debate, basically. Well, I just want, uh, you didn't, it wasn't clear what, what line you took. I mean, uh, I tend to sub subscribe to the opposite line, that it's not a matter now of having the brain reconstruct a, a picture, as it were, of the outside world, because, it, because otherwise who's looking at the picture? Is that the what same way with the retina, the idea of the... The goggles, the inversion of the of yeah. the image on the retina, yeah. that's only optically speaking an image on the retina because um, nobody's actually looking at the retina anymore. Well, I mean, so yeah. It's, so it's, it's, it's a subtle thing about embodied it's all, condition. It's all about sort of definitions because, um, in terms of visual perception, you know, the eyes are kind of how what we think of visual perception to be, and so it allows light through the eyes and it goes into your visual cortex, but even if you're blind, your visual cortex is still there. 
So you can use other devices um, to allow your to allow at least to be able to see depth and space, because you can use you can use devices that um, your body adapts to through its exploration of the world, through it, it, objects that allow basically stimulate that part of the brain, and so you can kind of see. So it is things like that kind of demonstrate the relationship with. The body that you your perception has, or how you yeah. perceive the body. Could I just quickly ask you to comment on the notion that the universe might be uh, like the brain or analogous. It doesn't seem very promising analogy to me. Or it might maybe only go so far. You know, maybe not as far as a human brain. Maybe yeah. as far as the brain of a chicken. Say, would that be? Do you want me to comment on that? Yeah. Well, it really depends what position you're coming from, because ultimately. It depends what kind of camp you're in in terms of where we come from, really, because ultimately we all come from stars. You know, if you, most people agree that the Big Bang happened, and so, you know, we come from this stardust. And I, I definitely fall in the camp where I think that there are, you know, still, this is a massive subject, but um, <laughs> the way that the world, there are certain, there are certain kind of rules or systems in play that allow things to happen and I don't think that you can disconnect any of them, they're all connected because otherwise, you know, then you have a different, perhaps a different belief system but this is, that's the position that I think, well, I think a lot of us come from. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's a good place to end it, that all things are connected. This is all <laughs> systems within systems because that's a nice segue to the next section. Um, Hopefully, and they've only had 10 minutes presentation to get their subjects, so there is far more to be unravelled. And uh, you guys are going to be around at lunchtime, um, so from 1.45 to 2.30. If you have more questions that you'd like to ask informally, they'll be around the work. Um, so go do take a look over lunchtime. Um, but allow me, uh, join me in thanking our three speakers for this. Oh, thank you.